So I'm happy to have Alan Downey from Olin College here. Uh, he's a professor of computer science at Olin, and Olin is a very unique in, um, engineering undergraduate institution. Um, and he's going to tell you a little bit about that, but he's been doing a lot of thinking about computational thinking. And that's the main thing that he's going to tell us about today. So uh, welcome, Alan, and uh, hope you want to do. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as, as, as Jason said, I'm coming out from Oldham College. If you don't know where we are, this is Boston, and we are about 10 miles outside of Boston. Pretty much this whole area is currently underwater, but we'll, we'll get that straightened out. Uh, I'm teaching at Olin. Uh, that's our campus on the left, and that's me on the right. Uh, our mission, we started about 15 years ago. Our mission is to fix engineering education. And so. The job is really simultaneously to take care of our students and prepare them, but also start from scratch and think about what engineering should be, how to teach it, how to prepare the next generation of engineers. A big chunk of this that I'm working on is this series of books, which is about taking computation as a tool for learning everything. And you can almost from left to right follow me learning different stuff. So I started with Python on the left, and gradually started applying that to things like statistics and Bayesian statistics, where I kind of felt like I knew what I was talking about, and digital signal processing and complexity science, where I kind of don't. But one of the things I'm going to talk about when you use programming as a, a way to get into new topics, you can simultaneously teach yourself and teach others, and move away from the model that says, I have to be the font of all knowledge, to using computation as a model of learning, as a way of ingesting material and making it visible to you and visible to your audience. So that's a big part of what I'm talking about today. Speaking of audience, I want to get a sense of who you all are so I know which parts of this I should explain more or less. Curious to know, starting out, how many of you know at least a little bit of Python? Wow, okay, good. Um, how many of you self-identify as engineers? <laughs> okay, how about scientists? Bayesians? Frequentists? <laughs> <laughs> Musicians? Okay, I'm gonna have a couple of examples related to sound. How many did I miss completely? How about no, is there anybody in the room who said no to all of those? All right, okay, good, thank you. That gives me a sense. So I'm going to talk about Python, not in the obvious way of here's a programming language that solves programming problems. I'm talking about Python as a way of communicating, exploring, and teaching and learning. And I'm going to give one example for each of those four things. First one, thinking about communicating. The first generation of programming was really the idea of translation. I'm going to take well understood ideas and express them in the form of code. So coding, you know, thinking of programming as coding, we are encoding an idea. Or things like Fortran, the name Fortran is from formula translation. That is the idea that you already know the answer, you're just expressing it. Um, so I want to give an example from computer science of Brett First search. For a long time when you were studying algorithms, you would see them first in the form of pseudocode because the programming languages that we had, things like assembly language and C, were so low level that if I showed you this algorithm in code, it would be very hard to see what's going on through all the details. So I would start by taking the concept, translating it into pseudocode, and then translating it again into the programming language. So this is what an algorithms book would look like in 1985. And this is the same algorithm on Wikipedia about 15 years later, maybe, maybe less. Maybe recently, this is kind of what it looks like. And if you know some Python, you might notice that this is gradually looking less and less like math and more and more like Python. In fact, from here to a Python implementation of Brett first search is a pretty small step. And one thing that you might notice, this is now working Python. That's not executable code. But I would claim that this executable program is now more concise and more readable than the pseudocode that we started with. Which suggests that maybe we don't need pseudocode anymore. We 
We don't have to go through multiple steps of translation because we've got a language that has the properties that we want. It's readable, it's concise, and it's expressive. So instead of a three-step process, well, maybe we can get rid of the math notation because we have all of these properties that we want. We can get to a two-step process that says, I'm going to do my thinking in natural language, and I'm going to go directly to code. No pseudocode, no mathematic no notation. Or, and this is where I'm headed with this, just start doing your thinking in Python. And I'll give some examples of, of what I'm getting at with that. So here's the first one. So let's say that you want to check to see whether two things are anagrams. And I'm going to kind of start out silly and gradually work my way up to things that programs that actually do something. But let's say you want to know whether two words are anagrams of each other. And what that means is that they uh, can, you can rearrange the letters from one of them to spell the other. So stop and pots are anagrams, and it turns out refragmentation and empty ferromagnet, those are anagrams. And in the first case, you could kind of just look at it and convince yourself that it's true. In the second case, you might have to get out a piece of paper. And as a human being, you would probably use an algorithm that's kind of like this. You would work your way through the first word, and for each letter in the first word, you would cross out the corresponding letter in the second word. And if you get all the way to the end, and you used up all the letters, and you didn't run out of letters, then it's an anagram. So here's what that would look like if you went directly from human algorithm to code. You might see something like this. So I've got a function here that takes two words, so those are strings. I'm going to convert one of them to a list because that lets me remove characters from the list. And then I'm going to loop through the characters. So this is basically in code what we were just doing uh, on the chalkboard. Every time I see a character that's not available, that's not, no longer in the list, that means immediately that it can't be an anagram. So I can say false immediately. Every time I do see the character that I'm looking for, I'll remove it from the list. If I get through the whole loop without ever hitting the false, then that means I was able to find all the letters I need. And then the last thing I have to check is to make sure that all the letters got used up. So when I'm done, the list had better be empty. The length of the list had better be zero. Okay. So I could probably convince you by enough kind of pointing and arguing that that is a correct algorithm for solving this problem, but it's not a particularly good one. I'm going to show you a different version now that uses a counter object in Python. And I'm curious, a lot of you said that you know some Python. How many of you are familiar with the counter object? Ah, okay, good. You're going to learn something. So this is uh, not core Python. It's in one of the modules, so you have to import it. But what it gives you is, let's just see if I, yeah. It gives you a, a mapping from each, in this case, a letter in one of the words to the number of times that it appears. So it's a little bit like a set in the sense that it just keeps track of the letters, but it is technically, in math speak, a multi-set because it keeps track of how many times each letter appears. And you can use it like this. You can create a counter object and give it a word. And what you'll get is a data structure that knows which letters appeared and how many times each one appeared. So you can build it very quickly. And it turns out that that object, the counter object, knows how to define equality. It knows that it should compare all the letters and make sure that they appear the same number of times. And so this is the one-liner version of is anagram, taking advantage of this built-in feature of Python. And it's concise, and it's readable, and it takes advantage, it reuses software, and it's demonstrably correct. Once you convince yourself that you know what a counter is, you can very quickly convince yourself that that is a correct implementation. And for the computer scientists in the room, what is the order of growth of that algorithm? Comparing two, building two counter objects and comparing two counter objects in, as a function of the lengths of the two words. Anybody want to jump in on that one? It turns out to be a nice, efficient algorithm. It's, it is linear in the lengths of the two lists, unlike the previous example, which was n squared. 
For short words, that almost certainly doesn't matter, but from an algorithmic point of view, it sort of makes you feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> okay, so we did anagrams. I want to take one more step to another problem, which is the Scrabble problem, which is you have a set of tiles, and you have a word, and you want to know whether this set of tiles can spell that word. So it's similar to Enneagram, but it's okay if you have leftover letters at the end. So I'm going to solve this problem by taking advantage of inheritance. And this is one of the nice things about Python. It's a so-called multi-paradigmatic language, which is to say, if you want to do object-oriented programming, you can, but you don't have to. And here's where I'm going to make that transition and say, look, I've got an object, a counter, that almost does what I want, but not quite. So I want to start with an existing thing and add a new feature to it. And that's exactly what inheritance does. I'm going to create a new kind of object that I'm going to call a multiset. And it's going to be based on counter. And that's what this syntax means, is that this new thing called the multiset is the same as the old thing called the counter. It has all the same capabilities plus this new additional feature called LE. Anybody know what LE stands for? Less than or equals. So I'm teaching this object what the less than or equals operation means. And what it means is that I'm going to compare two objects. And by convention, they're called self and other. But you can just think of it as the two objects. And I'm going to loop through one of them and check to make sure that I have, let's see, more tiles than there are letters in the word. And this is a less than relationship because if I have too many, that's OK. But if I have too few, it's not. If I find out that I have too few, then I immediately say, no, I cannot spell that word with those tiles. If I get all the way through the loop, I can conclude, yep, yeah, it's good. And I don't have to check whether there are leftover tiles. So this is a similar operation, but now I've got this special new feature that lets me write the program like this. And Python knows that when it sees this operator, the less than or equals operator, it knows that that corresponds to this function because that is a special name that Python knows that corresponds to the operator. So again, I'm taking advantage of a lot of existing features, but I get to extend them and specialize them so that now there are more and more problems that I can express this way, very concisely, demonstrably correct, again, it's usable, it's extensible, and it also turns out to be an efficient algorithm if we care about that. Let me pause there for just a second because I'm kind of cranking through some stuff. Questions, thoughts? I've got, I think, two more steps, two more problems like this where I'm going to just add one little feature at a time, so see where I'm headed. Okay, so far? All right. All right, so here's the next one. I'm going to represent a probability mass function. So coming from statistics, you probably know what this is. How many people instantly hear PMF and you know what that is? OK, good. So if you are not familiar with PMFs, just one way to think about it, you have a set of random possible outcomes. And each one of them has some probability of being true. <coughs> so this data structure is just a map from an outcome, whatever kind of thing it is, to a probability. Here's what that looks like. I'm going to define a new thing called a PMF. It's based on the old thing, the counter, same thing we were just working with before. The only difference is that I want to be able to normalize it. I want to make it so that all the probabilities add up to one. And I'm going to do that by just adding up the probabilities before they're normalized, the unnormalized probabilities, and then divide through by the total. So I'm just looping through each possible value, each possible outcome, and dividing it by the total probability. And when I'm done, it'll be at least approximately adding up to 1. So here's an example. I'm going to create a PMF object that represents the possible outcomes of rolling a six-sided die. So there are six possible outcomes, the numbers 1 through 6. I'm going to create that object and then normalize it. And what that gives me is a map that looks like this. And by the way, it already knew how to print itself because I'm using the built-in <coughs> print method from the counter object. 
And it's telling me there are six possible values, and they all have the same probability, which is roughly one sixth. Okay, so that's a PMF. Let's add one more capability to the PMF, which is I would like to be able to add two PMFs in order to figure out if I roll two dice and I add the two results together, what's the distribution of possible outcomes? And I'm going to do this by discrete convolution. I'm going to loop through both of the objects. I'm going to enumerate all the possible outcomes from the first die, all the possible outcomes from the second die, and then the outcome, the sum, is just adding together those two values. And the probability of that particular outcome is going to be the product of two probabilities. This is one of those nice cases where I've got two independent events, so computing the probability of two of them is just the product. I don't have to worry about conditional probabilities, so I'm just going to compute two probabilities and multiply them. So that's it. I've now taught the PMF object how to add itself. And in the same way that LE corresponds to the less than or equal to operator, add corresponds to the plus operator. So I can write this now. I can have this object that represents the PMF of one six-sided die. And when I apply the plus operator, the result is going to be a new PMF object that represents the distribution of possible values from 2 to 12 and their probabilities. And not only that, once you have addition, the sum function comes automatically. Sum depends on addition. So I can add up three dice now. And it'll convolve the first two and then take the result and convolve that with the third one. And the result looks like that. This is what the PMFs look like. For the one die, the possible values are 1 through 6, and they're all equally likely. So that's the uniform distribution that's in the top left. For two dice, you probably know this, 2 and 12 are the least possible outcomes because there's only one way for that to happen. 7 is the most, most likely because there are six ways for that to happen. And you get this triangle shape distribution. And by the time you get to three, you get this thing that started to look a bit like a bell curve. If you've played any Dungeons and Dragons, that is what the distribution of your character's attributes uh, looks like. It is the sum of, sum of three dice. Uh, you can see from the room who has played Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and this is kind of a nice demonstration of a little bit of programming magic, sort of taking advantage of nice Python features. It's also kind of sneaking up on a really central idea in a lot of mathematical statistics, which is what, is, what am I demonstrating here? This is the central limit theorem, which is if you start out with a distribution that doesn't look very much like a normal distribution, it's a uniform distribution, but if you select random values from most well-behaved distributions and add them up, the result starts to look more and more like a value. In this case, it happens with n equals 3. So where I'm headed with this is this idea that programming is not just about translation. This is a way of exploring ideas by representing them in code and simultaneously de debugging your way of thinking and also building up a vocabulary for expressing computational ideas. You are taking your ideas and translating them down to the language at the same time that you are taking the language and building it up toward the ideas that you want to represent. This is what Paul Graham said in one of his essays from a while ago. You don't just program down to the language, you build the language up. What you get at the end is a solution that looks as if the language was designed to express the set of ideas that you're expressing. If you haven't read some of these essays, I recommend them. I will make these slides available if you want to track down the references later. OK. Next one I want to show is one more step. I'm going to solve the dice problem. If you were in the workshop this morning, you saw one solution to this problem. I'm going to show you a different solution now, taking advantage of that PMF object that I just defined. So here's the idea, again, harking back to Dungeons and Dragons. 
Suppose you've got a box of dice, and you've got a four-sided die, a six-sided die, eight, 12, and a 20-sided die. And I'm gonna, I've got my box of dice. I'm not going to let you see the die, but I'm going to randomly choose one, and I'm going to roll it, and I'll tell you the outcome. I got a six. And your job is to now figure out which die it was that I rolled. Now, this is a little bit of a toy problem, but it's an example of statistical inference, where you get to observe the output of a system, and you're making an inference about what the characteristics are of the system that produced that data. So this is a toy version of a, you know, the canonical problem in statistical inference. So we've got some intuition for this. If I roll the six, you can be pretty sure that I didn't roll the four-sided die. And let's assume that the, the die are labeled from one to n, where n is the number of sides. So six is impossible. The four-sided die has been eliminated. It now has probability zero. But the question is, well, what about the others? They're still possible. Are they all still equally likely? Or has this outcome now given us some information about which die it wants? So let's see if we can figure that out. We're going to use Bayes' theorem. This is the idea that we have prior probabilities, which is what we believed about the dice before we saw the outcome. And we're going to use the data to update our beliefs. And Bayes' theorem tells us how to do that update. Bayes' theorem gives us the quantitative version of that intuition that we were just doing a second ago. And I'm going to do it by taking advantage of that PMF object. I'm going to create a new thing called a suite, which is a suite or a set of hypotheses and their corresponding probabilities. So I'm going to start out creating a suite that contains these five hypotheses, which I'm going to represent with numbers. I could represent the hypotheses any way I want, but I'm just going to use integers 4, 6, 8, 12, and 20. Initially, they all have the same probability. So I now have a set of hypotheses and their probabilities. The hypothesis is the number of sides. The data is the 6 that I rolled. And now I want to do an update. This is what a Bayesian update looks like in Python. So I'm going to take as arguments to this function a suite, so that's my set of hypotheses, and the data, the outcome, the, the six that I rolled. I'm going to loop through all the hypotheses, and for each hypothesis, compute the likelihood of the data under the hypothesis. In other words, if the given hypothesis is true, what would be the probability of seeing the data I saw? If I can answer this question, then I'm going to take those likelihoods, multiply by the priors, and then when I renormalize the suite, I will get my normalized posterior probabilities. The only thing I have to do is figure out the likelihood function. So this function is now going to take the data, this is the six-sided die, and the hypothesis, which is the hypothetical number of sides on the dice. Each time this function gets called, in some sense, we are being magically told which die it was. And we're just supposed to figure out what would be the probability of getting a 6. So let me ask you, if let's say it's the four-sided die, what's the probability of getting a 6? Zero. What if it's a six-sided die? It's one six. What if it's an eight-sided die? One eight. So we can take that and generalize it into this function. It says if your outcome exceeds the number of sides on the die, that can't happen. So the probability is zero. And otherwise, the result is one over n, one over the number of sides on the die. That's it. We have now solved the dice problem. We need to execute the code in order to get the solution, but we've done all the work we have to do. This part is the same for every single Bayesian update. This is the structure of, a, of an update. The only thing we have to plug in for a specific problem is to figure out this function. Now that we've done it, we can run it like this. Create the suite, do the update with the data, and then I'm just printing uh, to make it a little bit prettier there's what the result looks like. So the posterior probability for the four-sided die is zero. Good, that's what we wanted it 
to be, we ruled out that hypothesis. And the others are roughly 40%, 30%, 20%, and a little bit more than 10%. So the 20-sided die is the least likely. Because if it were a 20-sided die, there's a pretty good chance we would have seen something bigger than 6. Since we didn't see something bigger than 6, that makes us think it might not be the 20-sided uh, die. So it's doing what we wanted to do. You know, the intuition says that it should look something like that, and Bayes' theorem tells us quantitatively what it is like. All right. Again, one of the reasons I'm doing this example is that I just think it's kind of cool that you can express a Bayesian update in a very short amount of code, and sort of nicely encapsulated bits of code where each piece is very simple, and then it assembles into a solution to a non-trivial problem. It's kind of, you know, if I had just thrown that problem at you and said to code it up, it might not look quite that pretty. The other point is to say that I'm not taking a mathematical idea and translating it into code. This is what Bayes' theorem looks like if you express it in mathematical notation for a discrete set of hypotheses. If you have a continuous set, that summation becomes an integral, which is fine. There are a lot of things that you can do using math notation, but if you're headed for code, it doesn't necessarily help you to go through math land. So this is what it looks like in Python. This is what it looks like in math. There's not really a straightforward translation from one of these to the other. What I did was really this. I started with a concept, and I independently expressed it in two different languages. I didn't do this, which kind of matters because what we're talking about are formal languages. They were designed by human beings. We kind of we forget that math notation was designed by human beings, but it was. It's kind of like a programming language in the sense that people designed it with a particular goal in mind. They designed it to express mathematical ideas, and programming languages are designed by people to express ideas about computation. And each of them is good at the thing it was designed for and less good at the thing it wasn't designed for. So when you do multiple translations, you accumulate the limitations of each language that you go through. When you do those translations, you are limited to the subset of programs that we can express in all of the languages. Now, I want to be a little bit careful when I say that. Remember, I said the set of programs that we can express in all of the languages. And that's different from the set of programs that can be expressed in all of the languages. If you work in multiple programming languages, you probably know that you know, almost all of them, not all real programming languages, are Turing complete in the sense that anything computable can be expressed in that language, at least in theory. But in practice, the limit on what we can express, the computations that we can perform, is not the ability of the language to express the computation. It's our cognitive ability to express it. So many things that we could do in theory, we can't do in practice just because we're not very smart. We're limited by our ability to handle complexity in our minds. And that's why language matters for programming. This is sort of the safer wharf hypothesis for programming. That's the idea in natural languages that what you can say is limited by the language that you speak. That may or may not be true for human languages. That's sort of a contentious issue in linguistics. But I believe that it's true in computation because the limiting factor for us is software engineering, our ability to handle complexity. And once again, I find myself face to face with Paul Graham, who said all of this stuff long before I did. Um, the more powerful programming languages make programs shorter. That matters because, at least in part, we keep the program in our heads, and we're limited in just the amount of stuff that we can keep in our heads. Here's the, well, the other idea from cognitive science that I'll mention is you know, chunking and this idea that we can hold about seven plus or minus two things in our heads simultaneously. And again, that's kind of contentious and not entirely clear that that's true, but it captures this notion that, that, that we have limited ability. 
All right. So far, I've been talking about it as a way of communicating. I want to shift to my second topic, which is Python as a way of learning. And I want to um, hit two ideas here. One of them is that we're going to explain what things are by explaining what they do. And the other is that when we explain things in code, we are taking ideas out of our head, <coughs> making them external and visible, so that when you debug your code, you are simultaneously debugging the ideas in your head. So this is getting toward Python as a way of thinking because I'm not taking a well-formulated idea that is complete and correct and then translating it. I'm taking half-baked ideas, getting them into code as a way of finding out whether they are complete and correct. Because by making them executable, I get into a feedback loop that, that lets me debug my brain. So I'll give an example, and this is me trying to teach myself kinematics. Uh, I will give you a warning that this makes my head hurt. It might make your heads hurt too. I would like you to get the idea of this. If you don't get the details, it's probably okay. Anybody familiar with this book? It's a fairly popular book for an intro robotics kinematics class. Started reading this. A lot of it is about linkages, robotics that consist of a sequence of joints. Chapter one is all about vectors and frames <coughs> and transforms. And I found that I had a hard time with chapter one. So I did what I do, which is I started writing code. I started to try to figure out what each of these things is. Partly because I discovered that I've been misled. The word vector, to me, from the context of computer science and mathematics, means a sequence of numbers, or a tuple of numbers, or a tuple of numbers, or an array. It's just a suitcase full of numbers. That's what I had been led to believe that a vector is. And then I encountered Euclidean vectors and discovered that that's not what they are at all. This is what a Euclidean vector is, at least according to Wikipedia. I don't know what any of that means. In part because it's the wrong question. When you ask what a vector is, you get a very abstract answer. When you ask what a vector does, you can get a very concrete answer. Here's what I came to figure out from working my way through the chapter, which is each of the vectors is defined relative to a frame. So if you give me a frame, and ask for the coordinates of a vector in a frame. That I can do. So you give me the frame, I will give you coordinates of a vector in a frame. But that means that if you give me different frames, I'll give you different coordinates. And then I also want to be able to do operations on vectors, and like adding two vectors. And it turns out that's not always legal. If you have two vectors that are defined in different frames, you can't add them, at least not in a direct way, you typically have to transform one of them into the other frame, and then you can add them, and then the result that you get, you can get that result in whichever of the two frames you want. So once I figured that out, I said, okay, so here's how I'm going to represent a vector. What a vector is, is a set of coordinates that's relative to one particular frame. So I need to keep those two things together. The vector has to know what frame it's in. So it has to carry around a reference to its frame. And this is a way of creating a new kind of object that contains two pieces. An array that contains the coordinates and a reference to the frame it's defined in. Now, I can perform operations like addition. I can do one version of this that says, look, if you try to make me add two vectors that are in different frames, I'm just going to say no. That's what, uh, if you're not familiar with raise, that raises an exception. It says, this is an error. Stop the program. I want to get off. The alternative, if they are in the same frame, then all I need to do is add the coordinates. And that's just a straightforward array addition. If you are a fan of functional programming, this is the structured interpretation of, of computer programs. You might be familiar with this idea that if you keep asking what it is, what it is, and work your way down, eventually the answer almost always turns out to be a map. 
or a function, a map is, is just a discrete version of a function. All right, so that's Python as a way of learning. Again, two ideas there. One is that I am expressing what something is by telling me what it does, and I'm getting ideas out of my head, representing them in code so that I can debug my brain. As a side effect, when you're done, you have code that's executable and maybe it does something useful. <coughs> but that's not always the thing you care about. Okay, uh, third thing, talking about Python as a way of teaching, and this is kind of the idea of all of these books that I've been working on, which is I want to teach people digital signal processing. How am I going to do it? Part of the motivation here is I love the fast Fourier transport. I, it's probably the coolest thing I ever learned. Uh, it turns out it's useful for all kinds of things. It gets used in engineering and math and science, so it's great. The algorithm itself is not only very clever, it's really just beautiful. It's, you know, in the aesthetics of mathematics, it's pretty cool. And once you know it, you just see the world differently. Certainly your perception of sound, because so much of what we, how we process sound is basically spectral analysis. Um, it explains a lot about the world and how we perceive the world. And it makes me sad that by and large non-engineers probably don't know about FFT at all. And F engineers do, but engineers come to it the hard way. This is the hard way. Uh, this is another popular book for signal processing. Chapter 12 is the Fourier transform. Because there's so much stuff you have to get through before you're ready for it if you are restricted to going bottom up, if you are working with paper and pencil, you are pretty much committed to spending the first week on complex arithmetic. And it's a good long time before you get to interesting stuff. One of the nice things about this computational approach is Python already knows how to do complex arithmetic. And in fact, Python already knows how to do fast Fourier transform. So I have a choice here. I could go bottom up, but I have the option of going top down. What I mean by top down is, if you're the students in my class, I'm just going to give you Fourier transform on the first day. You're going to use it. You're going to see what it does. You're going to apply it. And then at some point down the road, you're going to get curious. You're going to say, this is kind of magic. How does this thing work? And now you are motivated and interested and ready to find out. So for me, you start using Fourier transform in chapter one. I will eventually tell you how it works in chapter six. This gives you a lot of chances to just play around on the first day or the first week of the semester and try stuff out. I've got an example here that I think I'm not going to do right now, but if you grab my slides, you can play around with it later. It's just kind of a fun example. I think the one I'll show you is the sawtooth chirp which was just kind of playing around. So a chirp is a sound that varies in frequency over time. Uh, so things that go whoop, like that. Except if it's a sawtooth, that means that instead of being like a pure sinusoid, it's going to have lots of harmonics, and it'll have a spectrogram that looks like that. You can kind of see the fundamental tone here starting out low and gradually getting high. And all of the harmonics at integer multiples of that fundamental frequency. What you can't see, it's a little washed out there. One of the cool things is the really high harmonics bounce off the top and alias their way back down, and it's kind of cool. Anybody know what that sounds like? Would you like to hear what it sounds like? So I just played around with this, and the idea was just, I just want to synthesize some sounds, and I, I wrote the code. This actually is not the prettiest bit of code, but this is in, in the structure that I was working with. This is the way I computed a sawtooth chirp. And when I first played it, I just could not have been happier. This is what it sounds like. Anybody know what that is? That is the red alert from the original Star Trek series. <laughs> this is what it sounded like. Because you remember when that was made, that was like 1968. This was like cutting edge synthesizers. It's probably an analog synthesizer that generated a sawtooth, and then they just ramped it up through a range of frequencies. Whoops, why is that not playing? 
<laughs> That's the original Star Trek red alert. <laughs> I was so happy. And also, I just I love the idea that if you are in a life and death emergency, what you really need is going on in the background is this. It's like, everybody, stay calm. Don't panic. <laughs> All right. Let me do uh, one other example, because this is, I told you, the first week of digital signal processing. The last week of digital signal processing is the convolution theorem. And this is the idea that if you have a signal, and if you have a system that that signal is traveling through, you can model that system and you can simulate what that signal would sound like if it went through the system. So how do you characterize a system? How do you know the frequency response of something like a room? acoustics of a room. Does anyone know how they characterize rooms? There are a couple of ways to do it. Pop a balloon. Pop a balloon. Why is that? Because you get a sharp transient then that is really short. Yeah. So you're putting a signal into the room and then you're measuring what the output of that room is. And do you know why that particular signal, why you choose an impulse? Quite wide spectrum. It's a wide spectrum input. It is in the limit it is equal power at all frequencies. And so you are simultaneously measuring the behavior of that room at all frequencies. Another way to do it, other than popping a balloon, is to fire a gun. So here's a recording. Uh, let's see. There it is. <coughs> and I went, there's a great, there's a web page called freesound.org that has recordings of all kinds of things, including gunshots. So I grabbed that recording, and I grabbed this little snippet of somebody playing the violin. And now I want to simulate what that violin would have sounded like if it had been recorded in the room where the gunshot was fired. What the convolution theorem tells me is that in the time domain, I can just take those two waveforms and convolve them together. And this is what that result looks like. There's what the waveform looks like, and there's what it sounds like. There's a little bit of extra stuff there because of boundary issues, but I'll leave that out for now. What does that sound like? It sounds to me like somebody playing the violin in a firing range. It kind of sounds like a long, narrow room with very hard walls, <laughs> uh, which is, I suspect, where the gunshot was recorded. So this is one of the examples I often show this example at the beginning of the semester, and you can see what I say there, which is that it's kind of black magic when you do it at the beginning of the semester. And then by the end of the semester, you understand the convolution theorem, both this way, doing the calculation in the time domain, and also doing it in the frequency domain. If you know some digital signal processing and what I just said makes sense, that's great. If it didn't, this is the other place in the talk where I'm saying, don't sweat the details too much. All right. So this is, Python is a way of teaching First of all, you, you get away from the idea that my job is to prove things to you. You see, a lot of classes that are organized bottom up seem as if the goal is to construct a semester-long proof. And that each little thing that you do at every step of the way is the lemma that you need for the next theorem that gets you to the next lemma. And we have this idea that at the end of the semester, there's this gigantic QED that happens, which is enormously satisfying from the point of view of proof and enormously unsatisfying from the point of view of learning. Because proving that something is true does not usually mean that you really understand it. You often come away feeling like you've sort of been tricked into believing that it's true, but not really why, and maybe not actually believing it in the sense that you feel like you've been bullied into saying that you believe it, but not necessarily that you do. 
Going top down, I think, simultaneously builds practical ability to work with this stuff. You can do stuff, and you're also gradually developing feeling for why it's true, how it works, and so on. It's also just a lot more fun. You can do more interesting things on the first day of class. So to wrap up, fundamental idea I'm getting across is that things have changed. Programming languages have changed. If you're used to C, you're used to this idea that the code is unreadable and opaque. It's a necessary evil. But once you write the code, you never look at it again. Modern programming languages are so expressive that they are really different. There's a qualitative difference. Now you can use them not just for executable code, but as a way of communicating and thinking and learning and teaching. Uh, if you're interested, I've written a little bit about this. This was an article that was in the Scientific American blog uh, about a year ago. And this is a longer version of it. Uh, I, have a, I have a blog called Probably Overthinking It. Uh, so there are some more resources there. If you are interested in any of my books, they're published by, by O'Reilly, but they're also available free. So you can read any of them online. They're under Creative Commons licenses. So if there's any material there that you find useful in any of your classes, you're free to just grab stuff and mix it in and do what you want with it. And lastly, let me give you that. That's four different ways to get in touch with me um, if you have anything that you want to talk about. But I'm also... <laughs> yes, we have, have a few minutes. Um, talk to me. Tell me what you're thinking about. Ask questions. Please. Okay.